That was an F-111 crew escape module ejection. Part of this module's design is derived from successful crew escape systems of earlier military aircraft. But these crew escape systems of the recent past would not assure successful recovery throughout the extended flight envelope of the F-111. Here is a test ejection from a simulated F-106 cockpit. The dummy crewmen were ejected at 300 knots. Projection is uncertain. Stabilization difficult. And recovery hazardous. What happens to the F-111 crew module and its crew under the same conditions of ejection? Severance causes little discomfort. The crew is protected during ejection. Stabilization is positive and is sustained throughout the ejection path. And the crewmen during recovery and descent are not exposed to hazards. Those are the reasons for the advanced design of the F-111 crew escape module. In this film, we're going to examine the functions of ejection, recovery, and landing of this module. True, these functions are automated. Writing out an automated ejection is one matter, but doing it with confidence and conviction, that's another. We're about to see a static, zero-speed firing of the F-111 test module. Starting out cold, naturally the 3,000 pound module is going to need maximum thrust to boost it some 400 to 500 feet upward from its point of severance. The module's using full rocket force, and with minimum altitude, the recovery chute deployment is sequenced quickly, just one second after ejection. Ejecting at zero or low velocity limits the overall trajectory path of the module to about 450 feet of apogee and 450 feet of downrange distance. Its actual ejection speed is moderate and requires only slight decay before recovery begins. At the other end of the flight envelope at higher speeds, both the ejection and the recovery systems respond by delaying their sequenced action. We'll use a 700 knot sled ejection as a high speed case. The module peaks out at about 1200 feet in a 3000 foot downrange projection. Since the severed module's forward speed is lending an aerodynamic lifting force of its own, rocket power is cut considerably to about half of its full force allowing it to burn longer and to give a greatly increased downrange projection of the module. This takes four seconds, sufficient time for the module speed to decay to 300 knots, the allowable limit before the recovery chute can be deployed. That tracking footage gave us a pretty good impression of what the module's free flight behavior will be like in its two basic ejection circumstances slow or zero speed, and high speed. But what we couldn't see in those films are some of the pertinent anatomical details of the module itself. For instance, here on the exposed aft pressure bulkhead of the module are the rocket exhaust ports, or nozzles. In that first film we saw of a zero speed ejection, this lower primary nozzle did most of the work with a diminished longitudinal boost from the auxiliary nozzle here in the center of this port. But in higher speed ejections, the thrust is nearly equally divided between the lower nozzle, the primary, and the secondary nozzle. The secondary nozzle provides longitudinal stability for the module during ejection. It's a boost forward in direct proportion to the primary lift to prevent pitch up during the module's free flight. The rocket, already mounted in this module, will expend its force upward and through the module's center of gravity. This hood-like projection is the stabilization glove, which provides longitudinal and lateral stability for the module's flight. Along its upper interface here, the drogue, or stabilization chute, is housed in a compartment with a blow-off cover. 
This is the chute we saw catapulted aft immediately following liftoff in both test ejections. Pilots have commented that you will definitely feel the bloom of this small chute as it decelerates the module's ejection speed. These pitch flaps drop down at the time of the module's separation. Together with the stabilization flaps on the forward bulkhead, the pitch flaps are designed to prevent pitch up at high speed. The glove itself, the stabilization brake chute, the pitch flaps, and stabilization flaps make up the module's stabilization group. They do their work in the first few seconds after ejection. As we saw in the tracking films, the module's ejection speed must be reduced toward the end of its trajectory path before the 70-foot recovery chute will deploy. This ring sail type chute is packed just above its catapult in this compartment. Within seven seconds after catapult firing, this repositioning mechanism, mounted here under a center panel, will be released explosively. Ultimately, the module will be suspended from here and from a point on the forward end of the module, allowing it to swing to a level position for descent and impact. These closely timed module systems deal with ejection, stabilization, and descent. But the real job, the one which comes first, is getting the module free of the parent aircraft. That's a complicated system which does a simple job. To show you how it works, let's follow the Severin system in animation. The key to the whole Severin system is the eject handle itself. Once it's been released by squeeze and pull action, it initiates a dual explosive firing train. This firing train is the heart of the initiation complex. It's used as a kind of circuit board to interfuse the explosive shaped charge which is fitted into the seams of the module's splice planes. As the fuse or detonator cord burns through its path, it propagates a shock wave of heat and energy within its steel sheath. At key points, the charge wave is boosted or re-energized, and within a matter of microseconds, it completes its course, terminating in several component actuators, as well as in those main lines of explosive severance material. Though the shielded mild detonator cord is burning into its sequence, we see that the actual severance and firing of the rocket motor is delayed. Pilots say you will note this delay until the vital pre-severance phases of action have been completed. The first of these actions is to draw up the margin of slack in each crewman's restraint harness. A cartridge in each reel is set off and the harness automatically pulls up tight. This forces the crewman into a spine-straightened position, ready to accept the acceleration forces of the ejection. While this is happening, the emergency oxygen supply is brought into use. This 10-minute reserve of oxygen is manifolded directly into the normal supply line. The chaff dispensing system is explosively armed to release the chaff packs three seconds after ejection. However, the pilot has the pre-ejection option to bypass chaff dispersal for tactical reasons. In the fourth action in this preliminary sequence, the bulk of heavy lines, cables, and tubes penetrating the module into the hull are severed. This includes the antenna leads, secondary control cables, and the main oxygen line. The cutting is done by three cartridge-operated guillotines mounted at key points in the module structure. At this point, all but one of the pre-ejection functions have been set off by the SMDC. It's at this moment that the explosive compounds in the detonator cord burn up to and terminate in the rocket motor itself. As the steel tube casing of the SMDC ruptures its terminator, the rocket motor is fired. The firing of the motor instantly builds pressure which is then diverted to initiate the severance action and subsequent release of recovery gear. The rocket motor pressure relays an ignition impulse to the strip of explosive severance material, flexible linear shaped charge, which is embedded in the mating line of the module and hull. This rocket pressure activates a cue sensing mechanism mounted at the top of the rocket. This cue sensor measures the aircraft's speed at the time of the ejection and chooses the appropriate rocket force to be used in the module's severance. At speeds under 300 knots, the rocket motor primary mode is selected. 
It employs the primary and auxiliary nozzles for rocket exhaust. The primary nozzle delivers 27,000 pounds of force. The auxiliary delivery, 300 pounds. At speeds in excess of 300 knots, the bi-thrust mode is selected, which employs the primary and secondary nozzles. In this case, the Q sensor allows the diaphragm of the secondary nozzle to burst open. This increases the nozzle area, permitting 7,000 pounds of thrust to deliver from the secondary nozzle in combination with 9,000 pounds thrust deliverance from the primary nozzle. In both modes, the force from the upper nozzles provides longitudinal stability in the module's trajectory. This is the point at which we get severance. Regardless of the mode selected, the thrust generated by the rocket is matched to the velocity and altitude variables involved at the time of severance. Once the module is free of the parent aircraft, stabilization begins. There's a critical moment just as the module leaves the field of influence of the parent aircraft's body mass. The lifting module must be controlled from erratic motion or excessive pitch up. At this point, the stabilization brake chute is catapulted aft, counteracting any tendencies of yaw. This chute also helps decay the module's velocity, slowing it to 300 knots in order that the recovery chute may be catapulted. At the same time, the pitch flaps and stabilization flap are extended. Should one pitch flap fail to drop, its partner is restrained from functioning. During this immediate post-ejection period, chaff is dispensed. The recovery initiator now turns to the mechanisms which will deploy the recovery chute. During this period of deceleration and free fall, the Q-sensor is at work choosing the proper time delay before relaying a catapult signal for the recovery chute deployment. The Q-sensor measured the speed of the aircraft at time of ejection, at which time it chose either a one second or a 4.4 second delay in starting the mechanism which will catapult the recovery chute. The delay matches the anticipated time for deceleration of the module to 300 knots. Now, at this time, a G sensor, which measures deceleration, is brought into action as a backup system for the Q sensor. Either the Q or G sensors will unlock the barostat initiator, which does the actual job of releasing the recovery chute for deployment. This barostat initiator has one job, to prevent deployment of the recovery chute before the module has dropped through the 15,000 foot mark of altitude. Rocket pressure buildup unlocked the bellows of the barostat, but it cannot do its job until either the Q or G sensors have given their consent signals. When the module has decelerated to 300 knots and has descended to the 15,000 foot threshold, then the barostat allows the detonation chain to complete its course and set off the recovery chute catapult. The recovery chute is blasted away at a rate of 45 feet per second assuring that the covering bag is stripped off. The recovery chute is delivered aft in an extended reefed form. Now the chute begins to disreef and blossom. Within seven seconds after chute catapult firing, the bridle cables are explosively released, allowing the module to swing down to a level attitude. When the barostat sent the repositioning signal, it simultaneously erected the UHF antenna and inflated the impact attenuation bags under the module's floor. These bags assure a safe touchdown, even in a 20-knot ground wind, on five degrees of slope, regardless of drift direction. At the point of landing, the crew will become active again. Their job is to release the recovery chute at the moment of touchdown, in order to prevent the module from being rolled or dragged. Two handles mounted on the canopy beam are used for both flotation bag inflation and chute release. The first handle inflates the aft flotation and self-riding bags, which must be activated to gain access to the recovery chute release handle. On impact, the blowout plugs of the attenuation bags pop out, allowing the bag to deflate, thus softening the impact. This is when the air crew will pull that second handle which releases the clevises of the recovery chute's bridle lines. As the module comes to a soft stop on the attenuation bags, the recovery chute is freed from its attach points fore and aft.
Should the automated system fail to deploy the recovery chute, there's a manual backup procedure for releasing it. When the crews satisfied that they're below 15,000 feet, they pull the manual deploy handle on the canopy beam and the chute is deployed in the standard manner. There's another side to this ejection experience, one that's not quite so technical. Naturally, we're still going by the book, but we're not just talking theory. You see, this has been done before, in fact, not far from here. Some of the air crew's comments on the module ejection are interesting. Help to focus some of the technical stuff into more personal terms. For instance, back at the beginning, when the handle was pulled, they felt a definite delay before anything happened. And another thing, the rocket firing. It sounded like a cannon, yet it wasn't an exceptionally loud noise. When they lifted off, there was nothing objectionable, just the positive forces of acceleration. They said the free fall was stable and comfortable. The module was nose down at about 70 degrees, and they had a good view of where they were going to settle in. And later, when the recovery chute blossomed, they felt a gradual deceleration, nothing abrupt. The pilots noted during the descent that the standby altimeter and cabin altimeter were operational. As they got down a bit, there were noticeable fumes in the cockpit. Each man opened his canopy hatch a few inches, and the air was cleared. And the touchdown? They had a good way of putting it. It was like jumping into a pillow. While a considerable amount of reliability and redundancy have been built into the module systems, there may be a time when the module fails to separate after both ejection handles have been pulled, possibly due to battle damage. Pulling the severance and flotation handle offers an alternative method of separating the module from the aircraft in flight. Since the rocket motor is not ignited in this procedure, the module will have to be freed from the aircraft by gravitational or aerodynamic forces alone preferably under negative G-flight. Remember, the crew will have to determine when the proper conditions have been met to manually deploy the recovery chute. This will be your ship someday soon, probably one of the safest aircraft in use today, the first aircraft ever to use the crew escape module as we've seen it here in these past few minutes. It puts in your hands a complete automated system for your safety and well-being. One which will demand your confidence and respect.